progress plan. Thank you for such a warm introduction, Anna. I am. Um, I'd almost be convinced that I was half worth listening to after all of that. Um, I'm going to share my my screen with you. Um, and apologies for um, apologies for the for the PowerPoint thing, but um, I thought it was probably more preferable than than kind of looking at me for, for 50 odd minutes or something. So um, at least there'll be some pretty pictures um, to keep you keep you kind of um, you know interested. So. I'm really um, grateful to Anna and to all her colleagues for the invitation to speak today and to share with you some of the ideas from my recent book, Interactive Documentary Theory and Debate. Um, I've In the book and in this talk, I'm going to focus very much on ideas that I think are key to, to the field and key to ongoing discussion. So today, as Anna said, that's going to be around participation and politics. Um, I've you know got some kind of thoughts around some conceptual ideas that might be useful um, to take forward the, 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 the kind of discussion. Um, I hope I hope it'll be an okay presentation for you. I'm not gonna talk very much at all. I've, I've warned Anna, I'm not gonna talk very much at all about technology. Um, I'm concerned less with the latest gadgets and what's kind of coming up and what's next than I am with the questions that actually have animated us for a very long time and will animate us no matter what the technology does in the future. So that's kind of very much where I'm coming from. So I thought I'd share with you my own journey in interactive documentary. It began around 2009, 2010. So compared to many, probably a little bit late to the party. I stumbled across Goa Hippie Tribe and it came into my, into my radar as, as something that was going to be funded by the National um, Screen Funding Agency, Screen Australia, um, in 2009. And I thought this was a fascinating development. Here we had, um, you know, a kind of major screen agency deciding to, to fund something that was going to be distributed for free on Facebook. And I thought, hmm, that's really, really interesting. So the, so the project began by kind of bringing people together. So some of the folks you can see there in the in the kind of postcard who were active in Goa in the 1960s and 70s. And they started sharing their thoughts and their reminiscences about being in Goa at that time. And as I, as I watched this group interact, as I watched this kind of process unfold, I was struck by quite a number of, of things. Um, not least was the way the community was coming together around this project, the way language united people, and what I would call now the way the group came together to collaboratively verify um, the, the kind of points that were being made. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, eventually, of course, the, the project morphed into some very slick iterations, a television documentary and, and a very kind of slick um, web kind of presence. But the, the questions that really kind of got me interested in those early days are questions that I think have become really, really key to the field. Um, and they're still questions we're wrestling with. It's an experimental space. This was an experiment. This was some, this was an established filmmaker or an emerging filmmaker experimenting with Facebook as a platform for documentary storytelling and documentary practice. And, and that struck me as, as really interesting. It was an experiment in storytelling. It was also an experiment in engaging audiences and building audiences. And I think that's one thing we ought to remember when we think about interactive documentary, that as an experimental space, it's very much kind of bound up with trying to work out what is going to sustain documentary making as, a, as an industry and as a practice into the future. It was an experiment in um, questions of voice. You know, who was creating this documentary? There were participants there. There was this community that was, was collectively verifying information. But of course, the platform itself, technology also played a role in all of this. It, it raised questions about the very nature of documentary. What was it? Where's the text? What, what, are we, what are we looking at here? How can we begin to analyze this? And it raised questions about function. What was the point? What was the point of documentary making? Was it about providing information? Was it about building community? Were these two somehow kind of compatible? Um, and why did this matter? So it really got me thinking about what documentary is, what interactive documentary is, what the relationship between them might be, um, and what sorts of questions and stories we might tell about that kind of practice. So my sense of the field as it was emerging 
was that it was, as Anna said in her introduction, based on the kind of claims of rupture, claims that everything we knew up till now was, was somehow, you know, um, overturned by these new practices that were emerging in the di digital space. Whatever this was, it needed a quite distinctive theoretical approach. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm going to put myself very much firmly in the kind of continual continuation modulation camp. I didn't want to throw the conceptual baby out with the analog bathwater. I saw a continuation of practice um, and continuation and harking back. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of those explicit harking backs to historic practice. Um, so you know, thinking about the questions that are being asked and the lines of continuity and why it is that um, historic practice actually provides us with a lot more than we perhaps realise in terms of, of thinking about interactive documentary. So my the book that I've just kind of finished um, and which really builds on a lot of the publications um, that I've written over the years is about thinking of interactive documentary through um, from the perspective of documentary culture. So I approach interactive documentary as a documentary, um, and you know, which is not to uh, to ignore the realities of of change and technological experimentation, which is of course fundamental to documentary culture and always has been. Um, but, you know, it's to kind of try and understand how we can build on and, and connect with the debates that have, have structured the field. So the book picks up on a number of different ideas. I mean, it, it engages with questions of polyvocality, questions of voice, questions of form, simulation, games, theory, and questions about data. Um, and, you know, just a quick spoiler alert. Um, I, I kind of argue very strongly that scientism and, and the, the influence of science is, is far from dead in documentary practice and indeed it intersects in some interesting ways with um, contemporary data cultures. So that's kind of the, the big overarching project, but today I'm going to focus very much on, um, on, on one part of that story. But before I get started, I, I wanted to just say a little bit about well, when I talk about this idea of documentary culture, what do I mean? What is this thing called documentary culture? And this, this may not be kind of um, all that kind of revolutionary to many of the people on the call, but I just think, you know, it's worth kind of stating at the outset the kinds of things that I was thinking about um, as I went through the book. So I, I would argue that to approach interactive documentary as documentary is to ask questions across three different um, kind of perspectives. The first is about the way in which these projects claim the real and, and encourage us to um, think about realities. Um, if nothing else, these are projects that try to offer a distinctive point of view. They try to help us make sense of realities in new ways and they very much claim the real. I know that there's a real interest in kind of being expansive and inclusive in the field and, and kind of saying an interactive documentary is kind of anything that documents and does so using digital technologies. But I think we need to kind of refine that because I think there's plenty of things that do that that we wouldn't necessarily want to describe as interactive documentary. So for me, it's really more about how do these projects claim the real? How do they promote forms of sense making? And how do they um, communicate a point of view or a perspective on some kind of shared reality? The second dimension of, of what I call documentary culture is the, the ideas of desire and social function. What is it that documentary is meant to do? Um, because it's meant to have, an, you know, documentaries as, as a tradition has been kind of understood through this, this social function perspective um, with its kind of focus on citizenship and journalism and politics, um, you know, but also culture and, and, and alternative perspective at the same time. Um, and although, you know, back in 2002, John Corner was writing about the kind of the um, challenges to the, the kind of more publicly focused um, documentary cultures. I think that one of the things that struck me most about interactive documentary was the extent to which that, um, that civic, that journalistic um, and that political uh, perspective was very much foregrounded. Um, so I think that's really, really interesting. Not to say that there's not playful stuff in there as well, but I think there is a kind of certain seriousness um, to some of the work that, um, that has been created. And finally, the domain of interactive documentary. So thinking about how does this work 
as an experimental space nevertheless intersect with institutions, contexts of production, modes of distribution and critique and practices and audience and then I've kind of popped their user or player expectations. How does it kind of look and feel like a documentary? How is it made to be like a documentary? And so on and so forth. Um, and I should just say what I mean by theory, and let's, let's kind of come across as a little bit pretentious. Um, it, when I talk about theory in relation to the book and in relation to my talk today, my aim is really quite modest. Um, it's to focus on practice, to draw out from practice different strands of debate and scholarship, and to hopefully offer some provisional concepts, language and framework that I think will be useful um, in terms of making sense of the field. So... Today I want to explore two interrelated sets of questions and they relate to participation and they relate to um, politics. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the impact that participatory digital cultures have had on documentary practice, quite rightly. There's been a celebration of co-creation and the blurred relationship between documentary makers, subjects and audiences. There's the possibility of a more blended voice within documentary practice, and that's led to much celebration of the political potentials of interactive documentary. Are we seeing a shift from representation to the convening of publics? And does documentary practice support those publics to have political impact in new ways? Um, these are really, really key kind of questions for interactive documentary scholars. So I want to start with the idea of participation in documentary and I, first I want to um, explain why I use the term participation rather than some of the other terms that um, are currently circulating including things like um, co-creation. Participation is a really really important term for documentary scholarship. It's a term that has the potential to link media making and politics people can participate in the creation of documentary media and by doing so they might participate in a public conversation. So it's a term that links notions of democracy and ideals of deliberative democracy to media making. And it's also a term that centres notions of power, asking us to consider who has power, who does not, who is included, who is excluded, and that's both in relation to media making and to politics. But it's also a term that refuses to reduce power to simple binaries. It asks us to consider the messy complexities of power as it operates in practice. So while it's attentive to the power that the documentary maker might wield over the participant, it's open to other forms of control and to acts of resistance. Um, and just to kind of to note that, you know, this kind of harks back to my, my own PhD research, which was some completed a while back now where I kind of looked very much at the relationship between the documentary maker and the subject and kind of explored the complex power relationships between the two. So it's very much, it kind of, you know, intersects with that interest in power and its complexity in documentary practice. So I've kind of bobbed two pictures on the slide there and they're both really, really important pictures because they demonstrate continuity in documentary's participatory desire. Um, in fact, actually, they, they demonstrate an explicit and direct connection lineage between analogue and digital practice. The first picture is um, of documentarian Bonnie Klein as a young filmmaker working on the National Film Board of Canada's Challenge for Change project. Challenge for Change was a radical experiment in participatory filmmaking that sought to involve subjects in the process of media making. On one level, Challenge for Change sought to reconceptualise documentary as a public platform for the people, focusing on issues of concern to the public and involving the public and communities in the filmmaking progress process. So there's lots being written on Challenge, and if you're interested at all in participatory filmmaking, it's a really, really vital touchstone. But the thing that has been said about Challenge also is that it ultimately enacted a middle-class vision of documentary as a means of social control. That it was less about empowering people in the end than it was allowing them to see for themselves why it was necessary that they change. The picture below, the kind of more contemporary picture, is from the National Film Board's Canada a Filmmaker in Residence project, which ran from 2004 to 2009. And this project very explicitly connected with Challenge for Change and sought to reimagine challenge in light of the digital revolution. So you can see there pictures of young mothers who, um, who gave birth while homeless. 
um, and documenting aspects of their own experience and being kind of trained up in, in making their own media. So on the one hand, you might say, well, there's obviously a kind of evolution there. We can see people holding their own camera um, and taking their own media, and that's obviously a, a profound shift. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, how can we build on what we know about the dynamics of power in Challenge for Change and in that first kind of project as a starting point for engaging with questions about power in, in the digital domain? So how can we connect those two? How can we draw on one um, to, to, um, to engage the other? So the other reason I really appreciate participation as a theoretical framework is because I see efforts to involve subjects in documentary making as a response to something that I think has been really important in documentary culture, and that is what I call the problem of power. Documentary has always been a relational practice. As I say, my, my PhD was based on understanding that relationality in, rela in relation to, at that point, digital video practice. But it's always been relational. Um, and more often than not, it's been a relational practice grounded in unequal power relationships. Documentary subjects have all too often been the victims unable to represent themselves and subject to another's vision. And while I would say this is ultimately perhaps too simplistic, it certainly has and does point to fundamental ethical, political and epistemic questions. And in response to the problem of power, documentary makers have in various ways and in various contexts, looked for, for ways of speaking with rather than about others, ceding control over aspects of the filmmaking process, sharing authority and rethinking authorship as facilitation. Scholars such as Brian Winston have called for a renegotiation of the traditional balance of power between filmmaker and the participant with the filmmaker taking on a position of advocate or enabler. An ethnographic filmmaker and theorist, Jay Ruby, has drawn on examples of documentary practice to highlight a range of participatory ambition. So from forms of cooperation in which subjects help to realize the filmmaker's vision, and he, he uses um, Nanook of the North as illustrative of this, to collaboration where the subject gets more involved in the process of documentary making as with Challenge for Change. And finally, to forms of subject generated documentary in which the filmmaker can be more, more properly considered a facilitator. This idea of a continuum aligns very much with recent scholarship on co-creation in documentary practice. So this is a diagram of, of the continuum of collaboration from Kat Zizek and William Uricchio's collaborative project, Collective Wisdom. And if you are interested in this topic, um, I would really strongly suggest, um, recommend that to you um, as, a, as an exploration of different projects. So in thinking about power relationships, that they too point to a continuum. On the one hand, um, power in the hand of the media maker, and on the other, power can, can, you know, in the hands of the participants. And they imagine co-creation as some kind of ideal midpoint between these two extremes of domination. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree that everything could or always should be equal in terms of power sharing. Um, certainly there are cases where there is varying ambition around sharing um, uh, you know, power in the process of interactive documentary. And that's why I kind of lean back towards participation because it opens up various domains of analysis that allow us to get at the complexities of, um, of power relationships. So when I talk about this continuum, I talk about a continuum between um, a minimalist and maximalist um, you know, participatory intensity. And that's a term and a kind of framework that I have very much borrowed from um, Nico Carpentier, whose work, work I find really fascinating um, on participation. So I want to just unpack some of the, the concepts that I bring to bear on, the, sub, on the, the study of interactive documentary participation. And as I said, the first four draw on the work of Nico Carpentier, and in particular, his analysis of BBC Video Nation, which is another really vital touchstone for particip participatory documentary. Um, praising Video Nation as a radical experiment in participatory television production, Carpentier nevertheless draws attention to the various factors that we've called them structuring elements that enable and sometimes constrain 
participation and power sharing. So he talks about identity and the ways in which identities reinforce or challenge relationships of domination. So whether someone's engaged as a professional, as an amateur, as an expert, we very often engage people as ordinary people, um, a, a term that very often subsumes difference, but also kind of reinforces a kind of um, a, a hierarchy um, underneath kind of notions of professionalism. We take the notion of community for granted, but of course, and this is one of the things I'm going to talk about today, communities don't exist. They don't exist waiting for documentary makers to come along and discover them. Documentary makers make communities. And I think that's a really, really important thing for us to focus on. And some of the work in, in the field has done that, but I think there's, um, there's further that we can go on that score. We can talk about organisations. Um, and the ways that organisations themselves, their structures, the ways of organising work actually play a role in, in shaping participatory opportunities. Um, to some degree, there's a kind of a connection here between the questions that Sandra Gordenzi is asking in, in the, the kind of bullet point um, five down there, the what, where and when of interactive documentary participation. So looking very much, Sandra's looking very much at the kind of what can people do, when can they do it, um, to what extent do they have a kind of structural input um, and to some extent there's a kind of link there to, back to questions of, of organisation and how organisations are prepared or not prepared to kind of share power in that relationship. Technology is obviously incredibly key, um, you know you can see there a picture from um, Elaine Sheldon's Hollow which is an, a really, another really important participatory project and you know you can see there someone kind of um, learning to hold a, a small DIY, possibly quite accessible, but potentially quite unfamiliar piece of, of technology. Um, if interactive documentary is an experimental space, as it very often is, then I think it's really important that we take account of how those technologies mediate participation and whether intermediation is, um, is significant. And then there's quality. And quality points to how professional does the result need to be? How much is the is product the, the point or process the point? Um, does it need intermediation? Will people need training? And training is an interesting thing because on the one hand, you would say training is about empowering people. It's about helping them to tell their own stories. But we have to be aware, as Carpentia points out, of the role of training in actually shaping people's vision, shaping their idea of what a good story is and actually reproducing dominant kind of ways of seeing the world. And then I kind of supplement this with some, some kind of some of the kind of key ideas coming out of interactive documentary scholarship. So of course, thinking about the what, where and when of interactive documentary participation, drawing attention, um, oh, let me go back a bit to um, community and to the, to the creation of community um, and how that might intersect with questions of identity. Looking at questions of discourse and knowledge, um, as I mentioned in relation to Goa Hippie Tribe, it's really important to understand where power lies in terms of the definition of, you know, of topics. What's, what is the issue? Who gets to decide? What is true? How does that get, um, get, get understood? And there's, there's a great paper by um, Harindranath, which kind of looks at that in relation to 18 days in Egypt which I'll talk about in a minute. And then finally interdisciplinarity and the ways in which different um, disciplinary expertise might kind of feed into, into documentary practice. So these are kind of different layers of analysis that I bring to bear on a number of, of different projects. Um, and I won't kind of spend too long on this because I'm aware that time's short, but you know, if you start to look at um, projects like Man with a Movie Camera, which is just, and a lot of these are kind of older projects because I think it's, it's, it's easier in some ways to kind of get a sense of their longer term impact. But, you know, you've got an authorial agenda there, you've got um, quality, the product needed to be suitable for public exhibition. So you actually had um, a, very, a technologically driven template that guided what people could do. Um, in terms of identity, people were addressed as, um, you know, as vernacular kind of creative folk. Um, so there was a recognition of certain kinds of um, expertise, but it en engaged people as, as individuals rather than as a collective. And people were able to contribute to content, but not to the structure of the project. So there's lots of different ways in which you can see that hierarchies are maintained in that project. Um, then when we get to 18 days in Egypt, you might talk about 
a more open agenda. Um, it was really more of a platform. It's not clear how much structural um, uh, you know, participation was possible, but it does raise really interesting questions about identity um, and citizenship and, and you know, the, the kind of collective writing of, of history. Oops, I've done it again. My, my screen is very, very twitchy. Um, but the important thing about 18 days in Egypt, which I think is, is really interesting and links it to Goa Hippie Tribe, is this idea of, um, of community verification. So there's stuff on there that, um, you know, Giga Meta would say he's not quite sure if it's true or not. Um, so that's, which is really interesting. We can look at projects like Big Stories, Small Towns, which give um, particular importance to place as a, as a way of structuring participation. So um, again, this is one where Challenge for Change was an explicit um, touchstone. The project looked to reproduce the kind of way that Challenge had um, engaged community and, and they appointed community organisers, which was something that Challenge for Change had done as well. But they lived in the community for a while and they got involved in training local filmmakers. So thinking about, again, what do we, what do we mean by training and, and how does that work to reproduce power differences? Um, engaged local communities as in intermediaries. Um, and just going back to my point that I made earlier about communities don't exist. Um, Martin Potter says, while community groups were important, it also meant that it reflected intra-community disagreements and established social hierarchies. So that's really important to, to kind of bear in mind with these projects. And Hollow, um, which I've already mentioned, again, it's hyperlocal place and discourse around place, challenging perceptions of place are really important here. But one of the things that jumps out about this project is identity. So Sheldon had kind of conceptualised um, participants as citizen journalists, but that was a positioning that many um, rejected. And she wrote that, you know, I wanted them to participate and tell their stories and they just wanted to be interviewed. So I think we have to kind of think about how it is that there is this kind of um, tussle around identity. So the, this kind of framework provides us with, with a way into, and in the book I kind of go into it in much more detail, ways into analysis of these kinds of, um, you know, uh, dynamics, different um, power dynamics. You know, so why does all of this matter? You know, well, part of the reason that one of this, that all of this matters you know, and I go back here to Thomas War, who asked in the 1980s, why do documentary makers keep trying to change the world? Or to put the problem another way, why do people who keep wanting to change the world keep making documentaries? And I would say that people who want to change the world will always want to make documentaries because documentaries provide a way of engaging shared practices and shared challenges. They provide a way of seeing ourselves as part of a collective and helping potentially to galvanize efforts to to realize a shared vision so it matters about linking kind of participation in documentary to opportunities for participation through documentary and for all our celebration of of technology a, a point i argue in the book is that of course digital technologies and mass petition participation tend to be more minimalist in their ambition um, creating communities we understand some of the kind of issues there and practice-led research has been really important in unpacking that, but there's a lot more that we need to understand there about how documentary makers engage with and work with um, and create communities. There's a direct link to historic projects and practices, and so all of that scholarship remains relevant. Um, and it's much, much more complex than simply, um, you know, people can do X, therefore they have this kind of level of power. We need to go beyond that. And if we want to understand how people can speak through documentary, we have to start thinking about how they speak um, in documentary in the first place. So I would argue that we've tended to think about the relationship between documentary and politics in quite narrow terms. And that, you know, for the most part, we've focused on alternative and radical um, media. And this, although there's some really interesting and excellent work, I'm thinking of Katie Borum Chatu's work and Angela Aguayo, exploring how documentary is used within specific social and political contexts to bring about forms of social change. Um, and this work really kind of plays off, off a kind of exploration of rhetoric and shared identity to connections between um, sites of political action and communities. But I think that there's probably a broader story to tell 
And I want to kind of trace that broader story in terms of three questions about interactive documentary and politics. Um, the broader story that I want to tell is about how interactive documentary addresses us and positions us with respect to the realm of politics. So I've kind of bobbed it there in terms of this idea of the achievement of citizenship, how it calls us into relation with others and how it links us to spaces of decision making. And so these are three questions about politics and interactive documentary that have very much animated the book and, and, and very much kind of occupied my thinking. So I want to kind of explore for a minute the idea of documentary and citizenship and interactive documentary and citizenship and to consider the role that interactive documentary might, might play in nurturing citizens. Historically, citizenship has been an important touchstone for documentary practice. You know, um, Grierson was very famously kind of afraid, if you like, of, um, of democracy and um, what, thought that documentary was a very useful way to control the will of the masses. Um, and, you know, you could also talk about the place of documentary as part of public media and public service media and in, in entertaining and engaging the public. But in both of these cases, citizenship, citizenship itself is taken for granted. Um, and in the words of Peter Dahlgren, whose work I'm drawing on very much here, um, citizenship is considered received. It comes with it comes as part of the package with your nationality, perhaps with your age. But it's, you, you receive it, it's, it's there, it's fully formed. And Dalgren argues that actually citizenship is an accomplishment. It's something we have to achieve. It's something that has to be developed. And the media can play an, an important role in fostering the knowledge, the skills and the values that we need to see ourselves as citizens. He asks us to consider not just the information that the media provides, but the way in which the media addresses us helps to foster tolerance, helps to see ourselves as citizens, helps to promote civic values and provide spaces and opportunities to engage others and practice expressing opinions. These are private spaces very often. Um, civic cultures is the concept that Dalgren kind of presents there, draws our attention to the space between the public and the private. And this is a space where I think a lot of interactive documentary operates and in very productive ways. So if we take, for example, a game like Fort McMoney, the aim of Fort McMoney was to bring people together with others and to engage and to enact, to play out a particular form of deliberative democracy. Um, it invites a certain reflection on democratic values, including respect um, and the importance of active involvement in political life, um, informed decision making. And of course, it built on a particular model of deliberative democracy, which might equally be alienating to those who are typically excluded from mainstream politics. So again, we have to be very aware of taking things at face value, but essentially, you know, you can think there of some of the ways in which playing Fort McMoney might actually contribute to somebody's development as a citizen. Or a very different project, The Shoreline uh, by Liz Miller, which was produced in conjunction with and for um, educators. Um, and again, thinking there about documentary as something that can play a role within these kind of formative spaces, public yet private, um, which, you know, can actually connect young people with each other and help them to build knowledge. So kind of thinking about interactive documentary, you might talk about um, the importance of polyvocality and, and kind of um, perspective taking as ways in actually of building understanding um, and building knowledge, semi-public spaces as ways of um, practicing citizenship. So I go into this in more detail, but in, in essence, what I really want to kind of do is to make a plea here for the importance of citizenship and of the, the need to understand better how interactive documentary um, engages us as, and, and allows us to achieve citizenship. And then there are publics. There's some consensus that liberal democracy depends to some degree on citizens opportunities to come together and discuss issues of shared concern and to be heard by decision makers. Theories of the bourgeois public sphere have given way to explorations of multiple uh, overlapping and antagonistic publics. But pub the public and the notion of the public is an idea of a relationship between strangers and orientation towards collective and consensual action that is grounded in the creation and the circulation of discourses. Publics are created through speaking, but most importantly, they're created through listening. The convening of publics is something that's been of interest to interactive documentary scholars, Patty Zimmerman and Helen de Michel, um, and they've been particularly influential in their focus on, on spaces of encounter. 
We might equally talk about identity and community, recognising that each kind of intersects around relations of power. And much of what I said in the kind of early stage of the, of the talk in terms of thinking about participation, how people are dressed, how they're positioned, how they're brought into or not, a particular um, social arrangement becomes really, really important. To talk about publics is to think about a collective orientation to an issue and a shared desire to be heard. Um, and, you know, there's lots, of, I talk about several ways in which um, publics might be convened, but I do want to talk about one today, which is just this idea of dialogue, because we talk a lot about dialogic um, documentary practice, and I think it's probably beneficial to give some specificity to that idea. By dialogue, I don't mean um, the kind of back and forth of exchange of messages. There's lots of projects that you might look at. I look at the whiteness project in the book and kind of go, is that a dialogue? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, dialogue is, as I conceive it here, and I've drawn on scholars from, uh, who work in dialogue, is an attitude of openness to an encounter with another, a willingness to challenge one's own view of reality and to seek and to see the value in others' views of reality. Dialogue draws attention to listening as the flip side of voice um, and to, to the way in which dialogue is, is inherently unpredictable, uncertain and never finished. It's a kind of thing, in pro it's always in process. Perhaps the most interesting, um, or a particularly interesting, perhaps not my, but a particularly interesting um, dialogic project is Question Bridge. Um, it's been described as, as a dialogic method. Um, it's grounded in, in a notion of shared identity. Um, so it, identity is opening into a space where difference can be considered. Um, there's an inclusiveness of invitation um, to explore something that is shared, but also something that, that opens up in unpredictable ways. So, you know, what's interesting here is the way that video and computation works as a mediation for, for dialogue. Um, because some of these conversations were much too difficult to have in a kind of face-to-face -face setting, although the project did include that as well. So I think when we think about convening publics, we have to look at not just what are the, the spaces and how are people brought together to engage each other, um, but what is, the, what is the kind of action, what is the process around which they're connected? Um, and how are, how are identities uh, managed in that process um, and how is listening fostered? So those become really, really key uh, questions. I feel like I'm rushing through this much too fast. Do scream out if there's anything, that, any questions that you have. So I kind of want to, to think also, just before I finish here, about publics and political processes, because this is another um, really key point um, for interrogating the political significance of interactive documentary. Um, interactive documentary has the potential to connect with political processes in different ways. But there's also, we also need to situate all of this within kind of shifting logics of political communication, which I do in the book, and kind of consider how it is that many of the projects that are sort of more minimally participatory in their ambition also kind of demonstrate a connective logic rather than a collective logic. They bring people together around very often ephemeral expressions of effect and, um, and, and kind of very shallow kinds of forms of action um, rather than actually engaging people more deeply around shared identities and shared communities. That's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it is worth understanding that kind of shifting dynamic. We also have to think about how interactive documentaries do or don't um, connect with political processes. And I think for anyone who's interested in that question, the KIPU project is a, is a really obvious and important touchstone. So the project sought to kind of um, build a database of testimony um, relating to forced sterilization. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, on the one hand, there's, there's kind of, you know, an explicit um, idea here of this project as an agent in the fight for justice. So it's empowering people to tell their stories, it's giving them practice in telling their stories, and it's very much connected to an explicit legal stroke kind of political process. The project itself is also really interesting in terms of thinking about publics and how listening is fostered, um, and it's really a really great example of that. So Kipu has been described as a relational ch channel um, that actually was significant for the way it rendered visible acts of listening. One of the things about projects is that 
it's it's very often unclear. And a lot of the people who had been forcibly sterilised had told their story before, but had no sense of that being heard or acknowledged. And so digital technologies here and the phone line itself, so they used phone lines to connect and collect stories, actually served to connect people to each other and to international support networks. So if you're thinking about building a public there, you can see that you've got this idea of the circulation of discourse, the collection of testimony as a political act, but also the relationships that actually come together around that um, to make that um, a meaningful action. So it's a really, and that luckily there's a lot that's been written on the Kipu project. Um, so that's really important. So I, I said at the beginning, I wasn't going to talk about technology and indeed I probably haven't very much, but um, where does this lead us? So I want to finish just by reflecting a little bit on kind of what I think I take from all of this in relation to the field and in relation to the questions that we need to ask. So I've started out by kind of really wanting to draw attention to relations of power um, and to how power operates through technologies, through relationships, through organisations, through processes, and to kind of um, challenge the field to kind of make more complex its engagement with power. Um, so that, that's kind of what I think of as the, um, the kind of big project in which we're all engaged. Um, and, you know, there's potential there. And I'm, I'm, for all that I kind of consider myself to be in the kind of, you know, evolution, not revolution category, I'm, I'm neither celebratory nor dismissive of technology. So, you know, a lot of what I have written about immersive technologies has challenged some of the, the kind of claims of my definitely challenged the claims around empathy. But in the book, I kind of take a different tack and kind of consider whether um, there is a way in which we can kind of see a performance of attentiveness to the other through immersive media. Um, and so I think that's something that we might want to explore further. How can we actually use this to, so thinking back to civic cultures and thinking back to how we foster an orientation towards shared issues and, and, and other people's perspectives, then potentially um, immersive media has, has a role to, to play there. Um, you know, I kind of reflect a little bit on artificial intelligence and the growing agency of technology um, in documentary. And if you're thinking about documentary as, as many scholars have as a kind of um, socio-technical assemblage um, and taking into account the power of, um, of, of technology there, we might open up questions about possibilities for a deeper machine human collaboration and how might we then get purchase on the complex power relationships that that opens up which just strikes me as a fascinating but difficult question to um, to answer unless we teach um, computers to do interviews as well <laughs> which would be interesting um, you know, we've, there's, we've seen a lot of kind of focus on individuality and targeted documentary and how this might connect us and orient us to shared issues. Um, but that also retains, um, brings us back to questions about um, trust um, and, and shared kind of conversation. Um, and as I say, that then there's the power of data um, and the return of scientism and the return of science and, and positivism as ways of um, reflecting on and, and representing reality, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but is something for us to engage as scholars and as critics. I have given a ton of, well, hopefully a ton of useful things for anybody who wants to kind of um, explore further. There is, there is loads of stuff there. And um, as I say, I find it incredibly valuable um, as a, as a means of kind of engaging these questions. So I just to finish whatever, I, whatever technologies come along, I think we have to start by thinking about what we know about people, about culture and about politics and about power um, and looking at closely at how projects do and very often don't challenge dominant power relationships. So thank you all for listening. I hope it wasn't too, too boring.